It's hard to believe it happened to both our guests, but it did. They saw a sign posted on a wall, stopped, wrote down the number for more inquiries, and actually rang that number. Now, thanks to great signage in Atlantic Canada, on the show today, we have a head distiller for an award-winning distillery in Nova Scotia and the owner of one of the most successful cocktail bars on Prince Edward Island. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time. We're back today with the second of the two episodes sponsored by Atlantic Canada, the eastern part of Canada that borders on the Atlantic Ocean and includes the four provinces of Newfoundland and Labrador, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. First, we head to Nova Scotia to speak with Alex Rathel, the head distiller of Compass Distillers, and then we drive over the bridge to meet Steve Murphy, owner of the cocktail bar on Prince Edward Island, Slaymaker and Nichols. When I think of Nova Scotia, I think beautiful coastlines adorned with quaint lighthouses, succulent lobster dishes caught straight from the sea, and catching a glimpse of majestic whales, puffins and seals. The province has an amazing wine scene and some of the world's most beautiful vineyards but we are here to talk about their spirits. And who better to guide us but Alex? Now, I'm looking at you with a still behind you. When I see copper, I'm all excited. So we're here to talk about you and Compass Distillers. I want to hear everything. I want to hear how you got to be head distiller. Why don't we start a little at the beginning and go back to where are you from and a little bit about how you got there. All right. Where I'm from, I grew up in Nova Scotia in a really small town in Cape Breton, which is about five hours away from here. When I left Cape Breton, I actually moved straight to Toronto, which is like the most populous city in Canada. And I went to film school, actually, and uh, studied film production for a few years. In that time period, I lived in Sweden. I traveled all the way across Canada to travel and to plant trees and eventually after a period of time, found myself kind of settled in Halifax, which even in itself wasn't really my intention. But, you know, I've been here for 10 years now, so I guess it sort of fell into place in that way. When it came to starting to work at Compass, like anything in life, it's just a series of patterns and circumstances that lead you into different situations. And I guess the skill sets of a distiller it really is incredibly varied and uh, there's a lot of mechanical and troubleshooting skills required even beyond the understanding of the fermentation and, and the actual distillation process. I had been doing jobs in like electronics and construction and wiring and then I kind of got sick of that industry and shifted to working for this company here in Halifax that just did like beer draft installs. And I just kind of was like, you know what? I really like the beverage industry. I had been all throughout that period of time working on at-home ferments, whether it was with cider kits or brewing beer from grain and making kimchi and sauerkraut or whatever, just like fermenting tons of different stuff and experimenting, making ginger beer. And was that just for fun? Yeah, absolutely. Just for fun. And uh, I had a couple of friends who were also really into brewing and uh, it was pretty interesting to experiment and kind of get familiar with that process. And so at some point in the middle of uh, working instruction, I was just like, I'm going to go pursue a job in the beverage industry and I uh, started working for this company that just did beer maintenance and draft installs. And that was kind of fun for a little bit, but not really particularly rewarding. And then at one point I was just driving down Agricola Street, which is the street that we're on. And I saw this building being constructed. And along the fencing on the outside was just a banner that said, coming soon, Compass Distillers. And I was like, you know what? I should send an email to those guys and see if they want someone to come and work and you know, just do whatever they need to do, basically. And after a bit of time, I ended up you know, getting an email from 
one of the owners. And uh, shortly thereafter, standing in the early construction phase of this distillery where there was no equipment, but just concrete floors and a couple of framed areas. After a decent conversation and dropping off a bottle of ginger beer that I made, I was like, hey, I kind of know what I'm doing, I guess, when it comes to fermenting. And maybe you could use someone to clean tanks and stuff. Fast forward a few months, the distillery was completed and operational. And I came on board as an assistant distiller. And the head distiller at that time was a a fellow named Ezra, who was basically working with the construction crew. And he had a lot of interest in wine and spirits. He also had been experimenting with fermenting and distilling on his own. And he came from like a chemical engineering background. Well, let me stop you right there before we go more into the distillery. You said you were fermenting things at home and making kimchi. Had you tried your hand at distilling spirits? And was there a spirit that you loved? I had never really tried distilling spirits. In Canada, it's pretty illegal to do that. And I, you know, (laughs) living in the city, it's kind of hard to do that secretly. (laughs) Sorry, I didn't know it was illegal. (laughs) Yeah, you know, everybody knows somebody who has probably got a still, but... um, Oh my God, I love it. I have no idea. (laughs) Yeah, but I, I never actually done any like distilling prior to working here Mm -hmm. favorite spirit that's a really good question i guess around that time i was probably big into gin and i still am big into gin but my specific interests change all the time depending on what i'm working on is that new because from your learning to be a distiller i've always always really liked you know different kinds of whiskey and we just spent about a month or two like working on a bunch of whiskey production for this year. And working on that just got me right back into a whiskey obsession for this time period. And the same thing happened when I get into making rum. I just get really, really focused and interested and obsessed with trying different kinds of rum. The same goes for gin too. But we make more gin than anything else here. I spend a lot of time working with gin. And- I guess that makes you a good distiller then because you're getting obsessed by the spirits, but we'll come back to you're getting the job. Was distilling something that you thought that you wanted to do in the beverage industry when you saw the sign on the, on the wall? I wouldn't even say so specifically that I wanted to be a distiller, but I just wanted to be in a creative industry. And uh, there's something that's rewarding about producing something from, you know, raw ingredients or from nearly nothing. And and I f- was kind of more drawn to distilling versus uh, beer brewing just because of the fact that it was a smaller industry and it was also less familiar to me. And I tend to be the kind of person who pursues sort of intense challenges very frequently. <laughs> I, I like to like to do things like really intensely whenever, whenever I do them. Distilling seemed to be, it's just like something I knew the least about. And that was interesting to me. And you were there right at the beginning, which must have been really exciting. What was everyone thinking at that time? You know, the progression of different spirits that you would make and where you would be and and how, how you would get there in the future. I think like in the case of starting any new business, you have an idea of what you want to accomplish. And then it kind of really fluidly adapts to what works and what doesn't work with the within the community and also the environment that you operate in. Yeah. So our distillery here is very, very small. And in the sense of like craft production, it's on a larger size as we do have a fairly, you know, large still as a 500 gallon or 18 or roughly 1900 liters still. And we've got like 12,000 liters of fermentation tanks basically is like fairly large scale. We're not running 200 liter distillates, but the space, the physical space we have gets filled up very quickly as we bring in tons of grain and stuff like that. And I think, you know, we kind of became fairly well known for producing really interesting gin very quickly. And uh, that's something that we really focused on a lot in the beginning. Uh, We did make a lot of whiskey to put in barrels as that has a long 
aging period prior to uh, actually being able to sell things. And I think that like the current craft distillery model is to like, you know, everyone wants to make whiskey, but you got to pay the bills with gin for, <laughs> or, or, you know, vodka or something for, for a significant length of time. And uh, yeah, we really got lucky or also just like hit the mark on, on gin pretty well from, from the start. Gin's not really easy to make and it's, it's very difficult to craft a recipe and then also replicate it over and over again consistently, especially because ingredients are changing all the time. Right. Well, and that recipe, just to go on from that, how did you even figure out with the head distiller then at that time, you know, what that recipe could, in, could entail? How, how did you figure it out? We were both really lucky to work with a consultant from the West Coast of the U.S. who had kind of done a lot of startups with beer and distilling. And uh, his name was Jeff, and he was, he was a good early educator to be like, this is how you take your, you know, uh, 20 liter home brewing knowledge and turn it into a <laughs> 4,000 liter like commercial production stuff. And there's a lot of things that are obviously drastically different, but even drastically different from like the beer brewing industry versus distilling is quite, quite different in terms of production. But uh, in terms of gin recipe formulation, there's some kind of like standard ingredients, which of course is Juniper is the main one, and then like supplemented by coriander and citrus in most cases. And then everything else is little sort of flavor flares right, it's or- a, It's the everything else that makes your gin different, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Right. And that's the, the difficult part. And then there's a ton of other factors about just how you prepare and the types of ingredients you use. If you're using fresh versus dried, if you're buying dried ingredients versus drying them on your own. I'm three years in here learning that it's probably more worth our time for us to dry our own citrus rather than buy it just because it's better. It's freshly dry and has a lot more flavor character. The handling of maceration versus vapor distillation. There's so many different variables that have huge effects on, on the flavor. And I, at this point, sort of play with all of those variables to create, we have like more than one gin in our lineup right now. And in order to say, make one that's more juniper forward, I'll use the juniper in a different way or treat it differently in relation to its interaction with the alcohol. If I want to make something that's a little bit lighter, I might put some juniper in like a vapor path which is sort of the Bombay Sapphire is like traditionally known as like big vapor distilled gin. And, you know, not everybody likes juniper. I personally love it. But, you know, the reason why a gin like Hendrix is so popular is because as far as I know, they were like one of the first to branch off from like these really juniper heavy London dry styles. And, you know, the people who don't like that character are just like, hey, that's that's the gin I want to drink. And uh, I find that Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, you've won so many awards for your gin and there's so many gins that your, your distillery makes. Of course, the ones that, that piqued my interest, uh, all of them, but specifically, I was wondering when you decided, let's just use stuff from no Nova Scotia because we have everything here. About how many gins down the road did you think that, or was that in the original mix? It's actually a really great story. It's, it's a bit of like an accident where we were sourcing juniper from basically a local botanical supplier. And we were looking to make a batch of gin and realized that we couldn't actually get enough juniper to meet our recipe. And so Ezra and I were just like, okay, well, what do we do? <laughs> and uh, I remembered that on a hike, I had seen juniper just growing wild. I'm like, hey man, I know where there's junipers. I'll just drive out and I'll spend a couple hours picking it and we'll see if I can get like enough to top up the batch basically. And uh, from there, you know, that worked really well. It, picking juniper is not my favorite thing to do. It's really hard on the hands, but it is really nice. I remember specifically that afternoon in the summer, just like, just being like, hey, this is kind of a cool job. I'm just like out here in the woods, like picking juniper berries for work. And that's, that's really quite fun. I think from there, we started to realize that given the fact that 
But what we do here is we produce everything from scratch. And so we focus on doing everything as local as possible. Nova Scotia is kind of a really unique place in the fact that we do grow lots of grain here. We grow lots of grapes, there's apples. And so, you know, there are cideries that exist in the city here, which make cider from all Nova Scotian apples. There's like lots of wine producers and we benefit from having that distinctive climate and environment that allows for, for that. And so one of the big intentions of Compass was to actually do everything for real from scratch and not be buying alcohol and not be rebottling or just blending stuff, which from my biased opinion as a craft distiller happens like way too frequently um, in the industry, even in the craft industry. So yeah, we realized that because we were making our base alcohol, the, the alcohol that we produce the gin from straight from grain and not buying it, we're like, hey, we can get the main ingredients in producing gin here in the province too. There's got to be tons of other really interesting flowers, plants, herbs, the things that are either wild or cultivated here in Nova Scotia that we can bring in and supplement all of the other standard botanicals that you would expect in a gin and create something that's uniquely 100% Nova Scotian. And on top of that, we also benefit from the fact that we get our yeast from a local producer here in Nova Scotia too. So it just kind of like, it was the perfect scenario to be like, hey, we're actually doing everything from scratch and we can really just be like, this is uniquely 100% Nova Scotian. And that's kind of where it all came from. And so, so when you put it all in a pot and then tasted it, we were like, oh yeah, this is going to work. This is really, this is, this was meant to be. Yeah, absolutely. Nova Scotian wild juniper has a, an interesting characteristic that is kind of different from juniper that we can get imported from other countries. There's obviously different varieties that grow here in the province, but the ones that are suitable for making gin have this almost interesting, like ocean side salinity of, of sorts. It just reminds me of being close to the ocean. And that might just be because of the way that I think about flavors and stuff. So, you know, a lot of times with producing spirits, you kind of just make a lot of educated guesses. You taste things and you, you're like, okay, that should work. <laughs> and you fire it in the still and hope for the best. And, you know, as long as you have a pretty good idea of what things are going to taste like, it should work. We haven't created anything too disastrous or actually we haven't created anything disastrous. <laughs> I've definitely made some like very bizarre macerations or infusions here that I wouldn't use on a larger scale. But you know, that's part of it. It's like, if I don't know what something's going to taste like in the still or in a, in a gin, I'll just like soak it in alcohol and taste that. And it's not going to be an exact uh, replica of the flavor through distillation, but it will give me a bit of an idea based on how the alcohol and this, and the flavors are sort of soluble in that, in that medium. And well, one of the things that you just created was gin from a tree. Oh yeah, totally. Your Boston tree, right? That you send to Boston every year. For sure. Yeah. That's like a really easy one where I just use one of our standard gin recipes and then take the needles from the tree and just soak it in the alcohol. Uh, and alcohol is this pretty awesome medium for pulling flavor. It's really cool. And uh, yeah, you try things and you see how the flavor turns out and then figure out how usable it is. It's, it's really, really interesting and fun. Now that you had, well, then you had the gin was going along fine. People were buying it. You're doing the right thing. Compass Distillers has made the right choice to open. People are drinking your gins. While the whiskey is is being made, should we say, you've created a lot of other spirits. So where did you think you were going to go after the gin and between the whiskey starting? I think a lot of that just kind of came from... Ezra and I hanging out and talking and uh, we, we made an Aquavit, I think two years ago or a year ago. And that was sort of an interesting one where I was just reading about spirits and then, you know, kind of stumbled upon Aquavit, which I shamefully admit I should have known better given that I did live in Sweden, but you know. I was just... gonna say, was that because of your time in Sweden you had to make an Aquavit? 
not actually directly because I didn't really drink a whole lot when I lived in Sweden. It was just kind of a, you know, one of those time periods. But, you know, the, the whole idea of the flavors were kind of like really interesting to me. I was doing a tasting event somewhere and I just happened to stop in at uh, one of our local liquor stores and found a bottle of like Brennavin Aquavit. And uh, I was like, okay, I got to try this. And then I'm a big fan of Anisi flavors, which I know it also is super divisive, but you know, I, I'll take it. I love it. And uh, so Ezra and I were just like, okay, let's figure out how to make an Aquavit. And we put together a couple of like test recipes. And right here behind me is like a little tiny still that's about 25 gallons. So maybe just shy of a hundred liters. And uh, that one, we, we ended up doing seven or eight test batches on that before we kind of settled on a recipe that we were comfortable to scale up. So that's the other thing that we do here a lot is if we're going to make a big batch, you really run the, if you don't have things like fairly well put together, you can mm, maybe not do like do a <laughs> great representation of what you're trying to create. It's uh -huh. way easier to look at 15 liters of distillate and be like, okay, that sucks. Uh, versus like <laughs> 500 liters of distillate. Right. And then um, you're like, what do I do with it, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we did a bunch of little test batches and we settled on a recipe and then scaled it up. And, uh, you know, we were really, really happy with the way it turned out. Aquavit is a weird one for our region. A lot of people just don't really know what to do with it or what it is. For the people who do, they're super into it. And I think it's kind of a, a fun way that craft distillers can open up people's interests and, and just expose them to other products and other styles of spirit. The, you know, a lot of times when you go to the, the liquor store, you're just like, Hey, I want gin or Hey, I want whiskey or rum. And you just are in there and you're going right for that. And it's, you know, alcohol isn't like super cheap. It's not like spending a couple of dollars and it's oftentimes a little bit difficult to justify like spending a bunch of money on something you've never tried before. And I think seeing craft distillers pop up with these different ideas, even offer them in like small bottles is a great way to bring different kinds of spirits into like different cultures, essentially. And just the fact that we are making stuff, it gave us a lot of flexibility in being able to be creative. Another one of the more obscure spirits that we produced was like a Geneva or Geneva, which is like a gin predecessor it's like if you made gin with whiskey essentially instead of instead of vodka and uh, the whole history of that is you know is very very interesting and i probably you know shouldn't really dive too deeply into it in the interest of time but it's a really cool read so i recommend it but uh, it's like you know putting juniper berries in grain distillate is like the beginning of what we have now is gin and so it seemed perfect for us to be like hey like we're making whiskey, we're making gin. Why don't we kind of play on this, this whole idea too and kind of represent the historical part of, of gin production? Because here we are in Nova Scotia making gin, which is like a product obviously that, you know, is probably most popular and most well appreciated in, in like the UK. But it's a huge global phenomenon. Like everybody loves gin. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, supposedly they drink more gin in Spain than they do anywhere in the world. So it's definitely now not just not just for for, for us Brits. Should I say? <laughs> now to follow on from that with your smaller spirits, you know you're, you're making rum as well, mm -hmm. as you said, and the whiskey and the gin. How did you feel that the the local Nova Scotians took to your products? Were they willing to try? the new funky ones, the ones that they might not have heard of before? To a certain degree, yeah. There's always going to be like people who are more adventurous and trying things than others. And, you know, some people just want to kind of go for the, uh, the, the vodka gold standard where they're just like, this is what I like. And that's totally cool. You know, it's, it's just as much fun for us to make interesting things as it is for us to put it out into the community for uh, people to try. I think uh, this year was kind of a weird one, but uh, we started off with the intention of producing a lot of sort of smaller batch products and just kind of do these like really limited releases and, and make maybe a hundred bottles or something sort of very similar to what we did with the, the Boston tree gin, 
And with the pandemic and the couple of months that we spent just making hand sanitizer, a lot of that kind of got pushed um, heavily to the fall and leading into next year. But it's been really fun to create these little spirits and just see them received extremely well. We, I made a, a little tiny gin using stuff that I foraged myself from the coastlines. There was like wild rose and bayberry and uh, beach pea and all these like really cool little foraged edible plants. And uh, it had this really great characteristic that just what I was aiming for was something that just reminded me of like getting hit with like a sea breeze on like a hot summer day. And I think we produced something like 80 bottles and they sold out instantly. And, uh, you know, lots of great feedback about it. And I, I really enjoy being able to make those little things that remind me of characteristics of Nova Scotia and uh, turn it into something you can drink. <laughs> and, and how wonderful that you were there when the sign was up. Yeah. And you have actually not only grown with the company, but seen the company grow. Absolutely. Which is something that where people are buying the bottles, even the small ones, it's not just the regular gin, the London dry gin, the rum, the vodka, but they, they also want a piece of Nova Scotia, you know, definitely as well. Yeah. And the fact that you are in a position to be able to create, create those now must be very fulfilling. Yeah, I think I've kind of always been really drawn towards creative endeavors in all sorts of different ways. And uh, it's, there's a lot of work that goes into distilling and uh, there's a lot of paperwork that goes into this uh, industry too. But it is really, really fun to play with flavor and put together these interesting combinations of, of tastes. And, uh, you know, I've got a notepad full of just like really, really weird ideas. And I kind of go back to them and be like, should I actually do that? Like, is that, is that going to be good? But, you know, I'm going to just try it anyway. And if it doesn't taste good, then it just doesn't taste good. And I, I kind of am really interested in the, the whole idea of breaking away a little bit from the very standard spirit products you know we've got flavored vodkas we've got gin whiskey rum there's tequila which obviously we aren't going to make here but yeah there's i don't know there's just a lot of really really cool stuff but it all kind of fits into these like neat little categories and i try like just to push a little bit outside of those from time to time because that's where that's where i think there's a lot of potential and a lot of fun to be had and and just a Kind of give people different experiences with uh, with alcohol that you know maybe will work great in a cocktail or maybe would be just great on its own can you tell me some top tips for the home bartender top tips i would just become as familiar as possible with the spirit that you're working with and maybe that's understanding where it's made or how it's made but you know, just learn to drink things straight is a, like a really, really great skill. And it's it's almost like savoring dark chocolate. And it's it's really, really cool. And it gives you a really interesting idea of just all the flavors that are there. And yeah, I think, you know, your craft distiller, again, I'm biased, but your craft distiller is going to be the kind of person who's working with really interesting stuff. And, you know, don't don't forget about them. Give them a give them a look and kind of see what they're playing with because there's a lot of cool creativity in the industry. That's a great one, and no one has ever said that. I honestly like. I just drink almost everything straight all the time, and I've I've been to tons of like trade shows and craft shows, and everyone's just like, "What? No mix?" And I'm like, "Okay, just just listen, and I'll I'll change your life on just like how you approach spirits." Because you know, when I was a kid, or not a kid, sorry, when I was like just of drinking age <laughs> you're just like hey you're drinking spirits just like drink it as fast as possible and try to like just you know grimace through the burn and not taste any of it because it tastes horrible and like that is the case for like bad spirits but with with like really good spirits it's completely not necessary and there's like so much cool flavor so much cool flavor and uh, it's it's a great way to experience it i i go to bars and just ask for like neat gin because like you know why would i just want to taste only 
tonic. Canada, we have like kind of bad tonic and it just kind of like ruins a good gin in my opinion. No, no, I totally understand. And if you could be drinking anywhere right now, where would that be? That's a really hard question. I'm just going to like connect it to just a place that I really want to go to. It's just Japan, actually. I would really love to go to Japan. Obviously, there's a really cool, like very interesting Japanese whiskey scene and like just the mastery of blending and kind of like, you know, doing their own thing that's totally different from Scotch whiskey or American whiskey. And I find that really interesting. But I'm also just um, really inspired by the intentful craftsmanship of Japanese culture. Fabulous. So hopefully I'll be able to come to Nova Scotia and all of us will be able to come to Nova Scotia one of these days after the pandemic is over. (laughs) I hope so, indeed. I hope so too. And then we, we we can cheers to that. So listen, it was great to hear about Compass Distillers and you, your journey. And um Again, I can't wait for that time when we can say cheers together, drinking one of your drinks. Thank you so much. As we drive over one of the longest bridges in the world, we come to Prince Edward Island, or PEI as the locals call it. Known for its red beaches, beautiful farmland, and charming towns, PEI is also famed for its shellfish, lobsters, and oysters. And to accompany that amazing food... The island is home to the incredible bar that is Slaymaker and Nichols. One fateful day, our guest, Steve Murphy, owner of that said bar, also saw a sign. This time it was for a restaurant for sale. And just as he was about to move to Honduras, guess where he settled? Well, I am so happy to have you on the show, Steve. I don't really know that much about Prince Edward Island. I've never been there. So we kind of always start at the beginning of your journey to Prince Edward Island, I guess. And so tell me a little bit about where you grew up and how you got there. Yeah, it is it is a long story. This is not a conventional, normal story that you may have heard before, but there's lots of twists and turns that go along the way. But I am happy to be here too. So I'm happy to be on the podcast. I'm a big fan. I'm going to be a a gush for a second. I do follow it and I, I love it. So I think you're doing a great job. I'm just so happy to be on it with you today. If I'm a little nervous, that's why. So my wife and I, we lived on, in Toronto, Ontario. So we were both born and raised in Ontario. So you, and it's a busy city, city of about 7 million people. And we lived just in the east end of the city. There was sort of, down, sort of downtown Toronto people. And we had corporate lives. We were so into the corporate world, it wasn't funny. So my background was with 20th Century Fox for a long time. And I was based in Toronto, but traveling back and forth to the West Coast. I got two kids, I have a daughter that's still in Toronto, still in Ontario, and she's a paramedic. And I have a, a son who's with me in the restaurant world now today. And I travel 25 weeks a year, probably back and forth to LA. So every other week, I love the job. I loved everything about it, you know, selling movies and being in the movie world. And, you know, when we go to LA, we'd be on the movie set, we'd be on the studio set. We were, our building was right next to them where they film Modern Family and you see the core characters and the people walking around and get to know them. And it's a, it was a neat life. But it was every Monday out, out of Toronto work all day in the office, fly to truck. We had a time zones that work with you. So you, you leave Toronto in the afternoon, you arrive early evening in LA and you spend Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the office in LA. And then it's a red eye home every other Friday morning, you arrive back in around nine o'clock in the morning and you start your day on Friday back in Toronto. So I did that every 25 weeks a year and it started to get a little tiring, to be honest. How many years did you do this? That was about five years, roughly about five oh, years. So, so exhausting. Yeah, you know, the thing is, I loved it. Like, I loved the work. I mean, to be honest, I'm probably working more hours now than I did then, to be honest with you. So it's not the hours. And then Christine traveled about 45 weeks a year. So my wife was in a is in the medical field. She would go into a hospital after they sold some equipment, and she would get the, the equipment up and running in the lab. She's a lab technologist. And she'd have to be there for a week. She'd kind of get the equipment running to a government standard. And then she had to do a train-the-trainer approach to get people trained on it, make sure it works by the time she leaves at the end of the week. So she was 45 weeks of seven days a week. We used to have, we used to have an Excel. So I had two kids and and we had two dogs. We used to have an Excel spreadsheet that we would trade back and forth that said that how overlapped where we were not going to be home at the same time. So we can get a family member like her mom or dad or a sister to come in and and watch the kids and let, let the dog out and that sort of thing. So we traveled a ton. And then, so we got to the point where my kids moved out. They went to school. They got to the age that they were leaving. We were sitting on a couch one Saturday night, 
exhausted and sitting thinking, what are we doing? Like, we're killing ourselves. You know, we don't even live at home anymore and nobody lives here. We're traveling all over the world. So what are we doing? So we decided to make a change. And it took a long time to get that decision. I'll fast forward through that part. But eventually we decided, let's do this. What do we, what do you want to do? What could you, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you go? Right. And what would you do? And the worst case scenario is it fails, fails miserably. That's the worst case scenario. So we'd go back and get our jobs back. You know, that's the, that was our follow-up plan. So we put a number on the house and said, what do we think we can get for it? And if it sells at that price, then we make a decision. If it doesn't sell, we don't make a decision. And so it sold. So it sold about a, it was about, about a month. So we let in it a sell. month. In a yeah, month. well, in Toronto at the time, that was a long time. If it didn't sell in a couple of days, it would be a bidding war if it didn't happen. So we had we overpriced it and we decided to sell it. So the next day, once we had a closing, we went and quit our jobs. And, and I'll be honest, our, our bosses were shocked. It wasn't like they saw this coming or we even saw a whole lot of this coming, to be honest with you. Did you know where you were going to go yet? Or you no. still had no idea? You were selling we had- without knowing anything. Yeah, we had we didn't really know for sure. We had envisioned moving to Honduras. We had our eye on this little island called Roatan. We've down to visit it. We had a game plan of of owning some businesses down there and doing a business down there. But moving to Roatan, Honduras full time was going to be our main idea. You know, you can live anywhere in the world. Why wouldn't you go to the Caribbean, right? Did you have a yeah. plan to work in Honduras or you just were gonna yeah. fly? No, no, we were too young to play and we're too, that's not our style. So we had ideas. We had looked at a few businesses to buy and maybe some businesses to start. We were really green. We really had no idea. To be honest, we were traveling too much and working too hard to spend time figuring it out. We just knew we wanted something totally different. And we had our eye. There was a, there was a bakery down there in, in Roatan. I remember looking at it, maybe maybe an inn. But these are things we had no experience in running. But we thought we'd go and, and spend, we, we thought we'd go spend some time figuring it out. You know? So we quit our jobs. So then we had to have a yard sale. We don't own a house anymore. We had a yard sale and sold everything we owned. So we put we had one day, one Saturday morning, we put a sticker, a price tag on everything, like some clothes, you know, spoons and pots and pans, artwork, everything. If it didn't fit in the back of a pickup truck, I we didn't we couldn't use it. So it sold out in about two hours. We had it was it was like it was chaos, uh, and we sold everything in two hours. Got rid of everything except for a TV set and, and a couch that uh, we could sit on for the next couple of days. No one can see my face, but my mouth is dropped. My jaw, should I say, is dropping and dropping. You are such risk takers. Well, we're not. See, the funny part is we're not. And Christine's a lab technologist, very process driven, very structured. You know, I've been working in corporate since I was 20. Very, that's just, that was our lives. So this is really completely out of character. We just knew we we were, you know, we were too young to stay in the corporate world. I was looking to, to change jobs and it just became, what are we doing, right? Just, if I just change a job, it's going to be the same issues with a different brand. Let's just try something totally. We're young enough or we're confident enough, or we thought we were anyway, that we would give it a shot. You know, and like I say, the, we, our, our thought was Christine could get a job anywhere. As a lab technologist, she's certified. She could, there's a, they're in high demand. The worst case scenario, she'll get us a job somewhere else and we, and we have a good story to tell one day. So... Well, yeah, so we decided we had a plane ticket for Roatan on December, but our house sold quicker than we thought. So we, we, had, we were closed in September. So we had a couple of months to kill. So here comes the tide of Prince Edward Island. So Christine's dad and mom are both from PEI, even though they live in Ontario now. They have an old farmhouse that's been around for 150 years that they use as a vacation home. It's still the family name kind of place. Potato farmer, go figure, from PEI, that this is their history. So he, Christine's dad said, well, why don't you go use the farm? You, got, you bought yourself some time. Take a couple of months. Golf. It's beautiful down here in the fall. It's, it's really known for its golf in the fall. So we did. I know, yeah. <laughs> and this is just a pass-through, right? We're going to come here for a couple of months, and we're going to go move to Roatan. So the longer we were here, the more we looked around. We thought, you know, if I could live anywhere in the world, why not PEI, this, and especially in the summer? It's got the best beaches. It's got the best golf. It's got the best seafood. It's got the best people. It's underpopulated. The price is right. It's like everything you ever want. The temperature is perfect. The water's great. You know. So we started looking around. We thought, let's see if there's something here that we could do. So we looked at everything. Like we looked at gas stations. We looked at inns and some B and Bs. We looked at this one weird one way out in the, in the middle of nowhere. We fell in love with it, but nothing really suited what we wanted you know so it was late november and we're supposed to leave december and we gave up on the i guess it's not for us and i went for a drive one day to try to find a national park up on the north shore it's this massive wooded beachy kind of national park and i got lost i went down the wrong street and the street i went down happened to have the blue muscle cafe on it 
it's way at the end of this long road. It's way in a little tiny harbor right beside the lighthouse, right at the end of the whole, this little tiny village, the middle of nowhere. And we pulled around to turn around to get our bearings. And I saw this for sale sign in the window. So we, I don't know, we kicked it around. We talked about it a lot. And we thought, I got nothing but time on my hands. Let's call the number. Like, you know, so we called the number and the real estate agent answered and he gave us the price. And we we're like, I could, I could do that. Like that, it's a lot of money, but it's not a lifetime of money. We could probably make this work. Then we went and had a drink and had a had a beer at one of the local places here, our favorite place here in town called Gahan. And we went to this place and we thought we talked ourselves out of it. Like, what are we doing? I know nothing about restaurants. I That's don't know anything about the industry, right? That was going to be my all- next question. Did you know anything about the industry? Had you ever talked to any restaurateurs before this? So the joke is when you travel 25 weeks a year and 45 weeks a year and three meals a day, we <laughs> ate out a lot. So that was our training. Right. We knew what we would want a restaurant to be, like from the, from the table. Ah. We didn't know anything else, but I knew what we'd want, right? So we we talked about it for a while and we said, you know what? We'll kick ourselves if we don't do it. I know it's hard. I know they all fail. I know most restaurants don't make it, but, you know, just give it a shot. So we went and negotiated with the owner and we got, got the business. So that closed in December 1st. We took off to Roatan. I spent the winter in Roatan waiting out the weather because we had no other place to live. So why not live where there's no snow? And uh, we came back in April and got it going with a lot of scrubbing and a lot of work. We kind of launched our first restaurant. What kind of restaurant did you conceive? Of? Blue Muscle's up on the North Shore in a, in a little in a resort community. And it's where Anna Green Gables, I don't know if you know the novel, she's Lucy Maud Montgomery. It's all based in this area, Cavendish. We're right the next town over called North Rustico. So everything you read in Anne is actually happening up there today. Even though that was written 100 years ago, the lifestyle is exactly the same. And I read so it about 100 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. You, look good for you. you look good for your age. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so but we got it started. And we realized, oh, I'm not a chef. Christine's not a chef. We have no chef. We probably need to get something. So here's this building. It's an old deck. It's like a couple of fishing shanties put together is basically what this place is. It literally is right on the water. And the water comes underneath the deck in the morning. And it's all fresh seafood. Whatever the, the fishermen yeah. come right up to the dock. Whatever they bring in, lots of halibut and haddock and lobster and mussels and uh, oysters are right outside our water, like I picked up that morning. So we're going, I don't know how to cook any of this. Like, I don't know any of this, right? So we we hired and put an ad out for a chef and nobody applied. No one, no good chef wants to work a seasonal two, three month gig. They, they're real chefs. They have a year round gig. Jamie, our head chef to this day, eight years later, he walked in and he came in unannounced and he thought we were crazy. Two idiots from Ontario, kind of come down and start a restaurant, you know. He's right, these, spend these, summer. these city folk, right? <laughs> yeah, the terminology here is upper Canadian. So we're from we're upper, upper Canadian. Oh <laughs> and so you these two upper Canadians are going to come down here and try to start a restaurant. So I'll do that. I'll pay attention for a summer. So he started. So the problem we have is it took off. It's this old rustic building and we shined it up. And for whatever reason, probably because Jamie does a really good job with the menu, we, we, we bought the restaurant and they did about 4,000 people a summer in about two and a half months. We, we did 65,000 two oh. years later at our height. So, and it doubled every year, year over year. It just kept growing faster than we could ever handle. So Christine and I are in the kitchen learning how to cook on the fly, right, with Jamie. And I think that's where I got the inspiration for flavoring and mixing, flavoring and getting us into cocktails. It was the idea time spent of understanding the difference when you add acid and you have to add a bitter, you have to add a sweetener and how do you balance the flavor? And why does Jamie do what he does? So that's kind of how I fell into it. Then I got into cocktailing from there because the lineup at the door started to get longer and the hours spent in line started to get longer. So there's a two hour wait at points to get into this restaurant. So we had to have a great product. And we had to have everything. We couldn't just serve Pepsi and beer. You had to have a full range and a full bar. It couldn't just be a rye and Coke or rum and Coke. So we built a bar on the side of the building to, to, to make it big enough to house a real true cocktail bar. But then the issue was, how do, you, how do you get a proper bartender? You can't get a mixologist to work for two months a year, but you have to have a good menu. So we worked and studied cocktails forever. We had lots of winters off. We'd spend the time reading and researching, understanding, maybe drinking a few down in, in Roatan. And then we just started to develop a menu for cocktails that had speed, variety, but tasted good and were really different than anything else out there. Let me go back a little. While you were traveling and drinking out and eating out, what kind of things did you like? 
Were you an old fashioned drinker? Were you a cosmopolitan drinker? You know, what kind of things <laughs> were you drawn to? Cocktail I knew, I see, I, yeah, I knew nothing about cocktails. You know, oh. I, like a, a daiquiri was my cocktail. You know, beer was my cocktail. If they added vodka to it, that's that's my idea of a cocktail. So <laughs> I really got into scotch and and sort of whiskeys and old fashions. So that's kind of how I started for sure. Simple, a uh, little more really booze forward kind of drinks. And then Christine was really on the opposite end of the scale. She was really, she started out being a little less boost forward. And actually, it's amazing the transformation that she's now a little more boost forward. And there's a whole trend on the island of becoming way more boost forward than ever before. And I don't know if it's the same everywhere else, but the idea that is kind of really trending. In Honduras, you were, and I'm assuming you were drinking more rum, kind of yeah. Caribbean, Caribbean flavors. Did you bring that feeling to your summer restaurant? I started to, and I really didn't want to. Even though I'm a big rum drinker. There's a Florida Canna rum from Guatemala that's huge, it's cheaper than water down there. And we drank a ton of it. It's a really great amber rum, and we love it. Like it's just a very easy to mix, very easy to drink kind of rum. And so we really just got into that, and they used to have it available here on the island. So we were probably one of the first restaurants to kind of bring that into a regular mojito style drink, you know. But I really didn't like our restaurant is in PEI is so pristine. We really wanted to have a true PEI experience when you're eating there. So I really didn't want to go too Caribbean with the flavoring. I wanted to stay true to the local scene. Mm. I really wanted to make it all about Prince Edward Island while you're here versus try to take you away from here to some other magical place that PEI is so beautiful. You really want to immerse yourself in PEI. And, and is there a lot going on as far as making spirits, distilleries, things that you can draw on, at least in, in the vicinity, to make that happen? There is, and it's really starting to come alive in the last five years. There's some distilleries now just coming online, and they make really great product. We use one of our we, one of our cocktails here, our biggest cocktail right now, it uses local absinthe. And it's like, it, absinthe is such a hard one to play with. But they've done such a good job with this with this local uh, distillery that it's easy for us to use. It's it. So yeah, it's really becoming a scene here. But just in its really super early days, like we're we're in a remote spot of Canada. We're way off the east coast. We're an island that hangs out here. It takes a little longer for trends to catch up here, but it's really starting to catch on. Well, it sounds like you already inherently knew the trends and went with it. So back to your back to your first cocktail menu at uh, your first right, restaurant. Right. So. So we did. So we kind of cheated the system. We spent a lot of time thinking about it, and we thought if we could take the same flavor pro- profiles and and cheat it, and we still use this methodology today. We cheat a lot of the drinks with prep. So you have a lot of time at six in the morning that you that can spend time to make the drink right. So you can make lots of infused syrups, uh, bitters, that sort of thing. But you, when you want this to be speed when it comes to execution, so let's spend the time up front. Let's get the flavors there. So it's an easy put together later. So we actually created eight drinks for a menu for a cocktail menu but all of them had the same ingredients but with alcohol or without alcohol so i'll give you an example so one of the one of the ones we had we had a drink that was sort of an infusion of probably my ties to the caribbean but had a little peach and mango flavoring and combined with 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 some vodka and and some blueberry syrup that we make in-house and with without alcohol it's a cinderella it's targeted towards young girls coming in with their moms kind of lunch day and then if you wanted, we had the same exact same drink with vodka added, and that's the evil stepmother, right? So from a bartending, from an execution, it's exactly the same. Now, were you making all of these personally? Yeah. So the first couple of years, I spent all my time in the in, in the in the bar. It was my 100% of my time, especially in the fall. That was my chance to really get to know, actually, what is it all about? How the flavors come together? How do you make sure you can service the customer, maintain contact with people that are sitting there, but crump really good drinks? So I spent, it took a lot of, a lot of trial and error in that little tiny bar. This was only a summer place, right? Right. So about five years into this, we had a really good staff. We had Jamie, our head chef. We have Donnie, our, our bartender is our full-time bartender. He's, Donnie's your career, long-term, old-fashioned kind of guy. You come in and want, he'll be, have the dish rag in one hand, polish the, the taps and talk to you for hours and really make sure you're having a great time. And he can really execute whatever you give him for cocktails, like perfectly, you know? So we have all this talent that we, we lay off every summer and every year you let them go and, you, and you, there's no jobs here for them. And then you hope they come back. And they did. We were getting really nervous the longer that went on. So we thought if we start another restaurant in Charlottetown, in the capital here of the province, then we keep them employed. We don't lose them. So let's build something where we can keep the staff year round. Let's make sure it's small, but really, really good food and drinks. And then that way it makes the startup easier in Blue Muscle. And that's how we launched Slaymaker and Nichols here in Charlottetown. 
So how long was that from you selling your house to deciding to work with Lane Maker and Nichols? Great question. So it's probably over five, a little over five years. So five years. Five. Yeah. So the first couple of years, we we spent our summers here and we took off and lived in Honduras. And right. we uh, actually, you came, Jamie came down to Honduras. We opened a restaurant there that we had some friends of ours that we partnered with that we helped them get started and open a restaurant in, in, in Honduras. So we were spending our winters in, away and then our summers here for the first couple of years. And as Blue Muscle got bigger and got sort of more of a real restaurant, as we joke about all the time, we it became a full-time job. We needed to be here year-round anyway. So, so you know, five years is quite, it's, it's a significant amount of time. Was there ever a time when you thought we made the wrong decision? You know, we talk about that a lot, Christine and I, and so we have some tough days, you know, 65,000 people through a building in two and a half months, three months kind of time. We do 70, that seats 75, and we, we turn it 10 times. We do 750 people a day in a restaurant that seats 75. It's a hard, hard business. And then anybody yeah. in this business can only appreciate it if you're in this business, you know. So yeah, we talk about that and we will have a chat and we'll still say, you know what? No, this is way better than we were doing before. And I loved our job. It wasn't like we hated our jobs right. at all. But there's just, there's such satisfaction in doing this job. You you make a drink and you, you spend hours agonizing over the, the ratios, which is stupid, right? Because, you know, no one else cares as much as you do. And then you serve it to somebody and you get that instant gratification or instant response. They either love it or they don't. You know, they, and, and when they do, it's, it's just, there's nothing better than that to me. They do care as much as you do. I'm just going to say that. They do care. Yes. Most people do. You're right. Yeah. Most people, and, and, I'm, and I'm learning that about cocktails. That's something I'm, that you're right. As I thought, it just, they just had to have cocktails because you had to have them. But people really do care. They really know their stuff. The at-home bartender is getting way more sophisticated than ever before. And they, they really know what they're doing and they really do care. Other than being a permanent place, right. what was different between what you wanted out of Slaymaker Nichols and your other place? Uh, everything, right? So we, we took Blue <laughs> Muscle Cafe, which is, is, is this rustic fisherman shanty on the dock, worn out wood, picnic table kind of style benches with really good food. And we came down here and we created this sort of art deco, looks like it really just rolled right out of early 1900s. Lots of dark colors and velvet and golds and the food and the cocktail scene we brought here was was completely different than what was here before it's the kind of place it's an old old house it's built in the early 1900s we gutted the whole thing and in the main floor right as you walk in the door there's this is massive white bar and it's got this white big marble countertop big gold brass taps you can't like the, this place is all about the bar it's all about cocktails it's all about the social aspect of it so it is completely different than what we did at Blue Muscle by by design is we really wanted to make this all about gathering cocktails. We actually designed it around cocktails and really, really good food, but like tapas style originally. Lots of strong flavoring, lots of small dishes, and then balance that with some really great sort of booze forward, really, really good cocktails. Now, I've never been to Charlottetown. So give me an idea of what the cocktail scene and restaurant scene is like there right now. Right. I mean, not so. Right now, not right now in COVID time, but in general, what it's like yeah. there, the selection and, and what people are serving and the things that they want. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, again, you have to understand the lo the, idea, the location. Prince Edward Island is an island and it's, and it's only accessible by one super long bridge, one of the longest bridges in the world to get that connects it, 15 kilometers long, roughly. And or by or by or by air or, or ferry, so it's kind of remote out there, and it's a real summer destination. It's all this whole island is fishing, farming, and tourism. In the winter, there's not a whole lot that goes on here, although that's growing in the last couple of years for sure. So it has a, an inordinate amount of really great restaurants. It's really focused on the summer and getting people here, but those those restaurants are open all year, all, all through the summer, especially all through the winter, especially in Charlottetown. And it's it's becoming the island is becoming known as Canada's food island. It is such a diverse range of food. It's all local. It's not like it has a lot of ethnic food, and even though that's kind of growing, the Indian seeds kind of growing here for the first time in a long time. But it's all about I know the farmer. It's all about fresh. It's all about, I literally know the guy who 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 pulls the potatoes. I know the people that make our our where the lettuce comes. I know the fishermen. So there's a lot that restaurants can do with that. So it's all about fresh food here. It's all about in-season kind of fresh food. The only thing that the work PEI is at in, in the spectrum of time and compared to everybody else is it's a real beer capital. 
I think there's seven now, seven going on eight uh, craft breweries or local breweries on the island. There's a population of 160,000 and there's going on eight different breweries that came out. So this has been a beer, been a beer town for a long time, a craft beer. And each one of these beer companies now are big. They're big in the East Coast and they have many different varieties. So it was really all about what's your beer selection for a long time. And that's still that identity. It's still who we are and it's still a reason people come to the island. But we saw that as a real opportunity to bring cocktails to the front as well as beer. And not, I would say not, that was not going on here before we came to Charlottetown. It was just not what people thought would go over very well because you thought you had to have beer, right? You had to have the beer selection. And we've learned instantly that people are, like we talked about earlier, they really are all about cocktails and that's becoming a real thing. And, it's, and they really are really passionate about it. And what kind of cocktails were they drawn to originally? Or uh, what did you have on your menu or things that you had to change because people liked it or didn't like it? Yeah, so we started with two things. We started with, we had wanted to have a good wine selection and a good cocktail selection. And then we also wanted a good mocktail selection. We're right in the heart of the city here. There's lots of government build buildings, federal and provincial government buildings. There's a lot of wealth in the city. There's a lot of lunch, big lunch crowd. So we wanted to make sure we had a mocktail scene so they didn't have to feel like they're going strictly after cocktails. But we were really started. So we started with a, like with sort of that in mind. And I thought being me, by being naive about the cocktail world at the time, I thought they had to be a little more sweeter. And I thought they had to be a little more mixed than, than truly booze forward or about the spirit, let the spirit shine through. And so our first menu, it looks totally different than what we have out there now, which is our second menu. And it's a lot more boost forward. It's a lot more creative with flavoring and layering flavoring than before. I was really amazed when we have this one drink. It's a, that our take on an old fashioned and we just make a different syrup with it where we infuse it with some cinnamon and cardamom, cardamom and cloves and, and allspice and added some orange bitters to it. And that became our number one seller. And it was the strongest sort of most simple drink we had. And that I started to realize it wasn't just the typical male coming in with the, you know, to have a martino old fashioned Manhattan style drink or old fashioned drink. Girls are really drawn to bourbon. It really became this thing that my eyes opened up that, wow, the scene is really is. I was completely wrong in what was going on. So we really, and I thought I had to have a lot of gin drinks and really, no, it's really, there's a lot of bourbon, a lot of whiskey in and gin, of course. But I was really amazed how the sophistication of, of the, of the, of the guests was, was way beyond what I thought it would be. I'm a bourbon lover. So yes, I think that it's, you know, things definitely have changed. People are starting to change their mind about what women and men drink. You know, I think just... Maybe tastes have changed. There's there's a lot more out there. We can try a lot more stuff. So, yeah, it's and also about the the sweet versus you know bitter or sweet versus less sweet thing. I think the quality of the spirits have really gone up a lot in the last little while. So I think they're a little easier to drink. I think you know back in the early days you had to mix it to get rid of that harshness of of, of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think you don't need to do that as much anymore. And I think it's much more enjoyable to drink that way. But yeah, the more I learn about this cocktail world, the more I realize uh, I got a lot to learn. Well, I have a question again about the spirits you said and about using local, I'm going to say it, PEI stuff. What ingredients are you using that are specific to PEI or the rest of Canada or the provinces that are close by? Yeah, you know, it's it's still a very new scene here in the, in the Atlantic Canada. You know, right now we're big on within our Atlantic bubble. We're allowed to travel within uh, the Atlantic region. So and outside that Atlantic bubble, there, there's it, it's really just coming online. There's really not a, a ton of variety yet, but the products that are coming out are great. And, you know, vodka is, is, is a clear one with all the potatoes grown in the area. There's these local vodkas. And I love when people come from away. That's what we call, call people that are not from the island. You know, people come from away and they have their favorite vodka. And, you, you know, you can know the brands that everyone loves. And then we have this local stuff. And then in the instant, you know, the normal reaction is, ah, it's not going to be good as that vodka like in France or the one, I, you know. And then they try it and it's right up there. It's really, really good vodka, you know. And there's there's a, there's a there's two distilleries that are battling out for the best vodka that, I, that I've seen in a long time. And I think that's just being local and being potato driven. And, I, you know, and I, then, there's, then there's other people on the island that are, that are doing mead and they're doing other, and then they've gotten rated where we get our absence from. And they're doing whole their styles of mixing of, of liqueurs that, you know, and they, they do a lot of flavoring of maple whiskeys and that sort of stuff because they have maple trees and everything else that's local to the area. So there's a lot of that going on. 
And the challenge we have is volume. So the challenge is it's expensive per ounce. And, that, and, and that's the challenge we have here on the island is when you start mixing a cocktail with it, you have, can't really charge enough to make up the cost of the ounce per ounce. But the product is really coming along. It's, it, it's you know, there's tours you can come when you come to PEI, you can go see these distilleries and they're really becoming award-winning, world-renowned. And they really are starting to make a scene, but they're still new, still very, very new. And are you behind the bar making drinks still? Or create yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, I, I am. I don't. We joke a lot. My whole role here, I don't really do a lot, to be honest with you. Here, Christine's more the back of the house. That's why she's not on this today. She's more in the kitchen. She's more a lab technologist, so she's more process driven. She's more about making sure quality control. Everyone's working the way they should. And then I'm up front. This is what this is what I do. And, and so I'm on the bar every Friday, Saturday night. I'm, I'm definitely there, and, and 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 that's where I love to be. You know. As I say, to, to, I love I love the hospitality. I didn't realize that I love the hospitality world. You know, I really like serving. I really like the gratification of getting to do do this and getting to know people and and see them come back again and hear their story and then and then make them some drinks and food that they like. You know, it's, there's there's no better place to do that. There's no better place to be than like than when you have that kind of thing going on. In my in my opinion. So, Steve. Can you tell me your top tips for the home bartender? Yeah, so here's my here's my advice that I that I think I could offer being a new at home bartender and now in in uh, restaurant bar bartender or cocktail. I think the big first thing is 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 you have to you have to start somewhere. So you really what you wanted is you really want to you really want to show off to your friends. Really, at the end of the day, you want to make a really good drink at home that you can share with people, and that's really what it's all about, right? I would I always suggest starting with a traditional drink. And then layering in flavor to make it your own, and that's that's really my advice. So start with something simple, start with what's out there, and then put your own stamp on it. And that's really the way that people are gonna you know, you could really show off your friends and really make a drink that's sort of unique to you and to them. And my advice when doing that is you gotta balance everything. You can't just add, when you have to understand when you when you add one thing, it creates an off balance. If you're adding a if you're at, sometimes you add a little sweetener because you want to reduce the harshness of the booze or the spirit. If you add too much sweetener, you should add a bitter or you should add, add an acid to help cut, cut that out. And so it's not just about adding one thing. It's about adding balance to each drink. And I think if you strive for that, you, you, you can't go wrong. I mean, you'll, you, you keep, keep exploring new ways of balancing out and trying new flavors. I think that's great. Okay. If you could be anywhere in the world drinking anything right now, where would that be? See, that's a hard one. We've been locked on this island for over a year now. So I want to be anywhere, anywhere else necessarily. And you're probably going to figure I'm going to go back to Honduras. I'm going to say I want to be in the Caribbean somewhere. But I'll be honest, you know, the, the, when I think about this question, I, there's this there's this bar in Toronto, this little lo local bar where we used to live. And it's an old building and it would spin around since the late 1800s. And it's on this sort of prominent intersection right downtown Toronto where two sort of north-south streetcar and the, and the east-west streetcar meet. And it's this beautiful building. And for about 100 years, it's been a strip joint. And it's been this place called Jilly's. And it's just been this gaudy, awful exterior. A couple of years ago, somebody bought that building, ripped it apart, put it back together in this beautiful now, just the, the, it's such a gorgeous building in the middle of the city. And on the rooftop is a, is a glass dome. And you can see the 360 of the whole, of, and it's a, a, you know, four seasons, 360 degree of Toronto. And it's called the Broadview Hotel. And I think if I would be anywhere, I would love to go back there right now with Christine. And just because that's where it started for us, you know, that's how we got here. And it'd be interesting to go back into our old hood there again and um, have a cocktail up there and see the city and see what's uh, what's changed since we've been here. Love that. That's very romantic. <laughs> I didn't mean it to be. So if someone wants to come to Slaymaker Nichols and meet you, you're there Friday, Saturday and Sunday? I'm here every day. Every I'm here every, every day, day. And, and usually at night. So I'm not. It's hard to be here every day, all day. But I'm here. Yeah, I'm all, like I. Yeah, that's the kind of running joke, as you know. Steve's going to be in the building when you come in. But yeah. But if I'm always on the bar Friday, Saturday, and Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, I'm always on the floor on the bar. All right. Well, when I come, I cannot wait to meet you, and have one of the drinks. They sound amazing. So you know, let's cheers to that time when we can all travel again. Yes. Cheers to that for sure. Looking forward to that happening soon. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. And now I feel like I know PEI so much better. You have to come check this place out. Everyone, you got to be careful. When you come to check out PEI, you fall in love with it and you end up staying just like we did. And that happens. You hear that story a lot. So I hope you do come. You, I know you'd love it.
I'm sure I will. Thank you. It was great to have Alex and Steve here with me on Lush Life. And thanks so much to Atlantic Canada for arranging everything. Since we have two guests, of course, we have to have two cocktails of the week. One shaken and one stirred. Our first cocktail of the week is the one I was enjoying with Alex during our chat. The Compass Distillers Paper Plane. Add all of the ingredients to a shaker. One and a half ounces of Compass Distillers Nova Scotia Rye. One and a half ounces of an Amaro like Nonino or Maletti. One and a half ounces of Aperol. And finally, one and a half ounces of freshly strained lemon juice. Add ice and then shake, shake, shake. Then strain it into a coupe glass and garnish with a dehydrated lemon slice if you have one and serve. Next up is Steve's Water for Elephants. He combines all of the following in a mixing glass. One and a half ounces of Willing to Learn Gin by Nova Scotia Spirits Company, or any gin. A half an ounce of honey syrup, that's a 50-50 mix of water and honey. One ounce of watermelon juice. And three dashes of Free Brothers Cardamom Bitters. Add ice and then stir. Then strain it into a cocktail glass and garnish with a dehydrated orange slice. Now you can drink like a real Atlantic Canadian. You'll find these recipes and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. I've been collecting cocktail books since way before Lush Life. This year, I thought I would start a one-woman book club and reread all of the ones on my shelf. Anyone can join in. I'll be tweeting about it. This week, it's David Embry's The Art of Mixing Cocktails. Audrey Saunders said it was a must for all of her bartenders at the Pegu Club, so I thought it would be a great place to begin. If you live for Lush Life, make sure you're giving back to the bars or restaurants you love by donating or taking part in cocktail or food delivery where you live. The music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly and wash your hands and wear a mask. Next time, our guest is passionate about nature. And this passion led her to cross paths with one of our former guests. Together, they are changing the world of cocktails. Until that time, bottoms up.